Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the final webinar of our fall series. Uh, this is the Summer of Relays, Secrets to Getting the Baton Around Fast. And um, we have a fast uh, group of panel panelists tonight um, to uh, to uh, share their secrets with you. So um, real quick, uh, my name is John LaFranco. I'm the manager of coaching education for Athletics Canada. And uh, like I said today, we have some some pretty legendary members of Canada's relay teams with us tonight. We have Glenroy Glenroy Gilbert, who's the, the current head coach, but also you may know him from a, a little team uh, known as the '96 gold medal team, um, uh, and also uh, PBs of 1010, 1001 wind aided, and 20.37 in the 100 and 200. Glenroy, is that is that accurate? Yeah, it's accurate. Is that, is that, all right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> long time ago. I didn't say when didn't say when Brendan Rodney uh 1018 but but check this 1996 in the two um that's uh that's moving and then Kara Constantine this I I'm, I'm pretty impressed by these times I gotta say I mean everybody I just I don't know this it's a, this is a, such a good panel 1174 uh 2316 wind and 587 in the four Kara is that is that correct I think yes. that was right yeah okay and then dana way uh 12 37 at 14 uh which uh i've been told is not that good but i don't know i feel like you know that's all right so but dana has other skills so we're going to get to that um but to just before we begin so you're listening to us you're muted if you have questions um you know you can address them in the questions box and then and on the uh bottom of your screen there um uh, our friend Kyle Smith is behind the scenes so he will make sure we see those questions um uh vous êtes le bienvenu de demander des questions en français si vous voulez demander des questions en français c'est Brendan qui va vous répondre right Brendan oh see Brendan said he spoke French before and I gave him a little test there but it didn't quite work but no man it's not for me I put my head down so uh what si vous avez des questions en français demandez-les je vais les traduire pour tout le monde Et je vais traduire les réponses uh, aussi. Um, so we're going to start. We're going to start with a little presentation from from Dana, um, and then have a little chat with the group, ask some questions, and then at the end we're going to get into your questions. So anytime you feel like you have a question, just put it in the chat, and uh, we may, you know, if if it's appropriate to jump into it right away, we will. If not, we'll we'll keep it to the end. The webinar is being recorded and uh, will be posted in the coming days on the AC YouTube channel. Um, at some point, uh, Kyle will, will throw the, the, that YouTube link into the chat so you can see that. Um, and coaches who have entered their NCCP number will receive one PD point for their participation in the webinar. Um, this is our final webinar of the year, as I mentioned. So we'll be back with some new topics and guests in 2023. If you have ideas about who you want to hear about or what you want to talk about, what you want to see, um, you can put those in the Q&A as well. And uh, Kyle and I will compile them and we'll try to uh, try to make your dreams come true. So speaking of making dreams come true, let's let Dana do his little presentation and, and explain how he masterminds this whole thing where uh, Canada uh, becomes the top relay nation on the planet. Dana. Perfect. Thanks, John. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, 12, 12, 30, something, obviously not very good. So the, you know, those who can't teach, is that the, the saying? So I think um, that's sort of where my strengths uh, lie. I think, are we we good there? Yep, is there? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, I could probably do a whole afternoon on a bunch of this stuff, but we're going to try and do this in about uh, five or six minutes. So uh, the Canadian Relay Program, I guess the first piece is, you know, I, the concept is Canada and underrated in the relays. Hopefully, if you're here, we, we probably, hopefully not think that, but I think on a much broader scale, Canada still gets probably disrespected. I know Brendan's, Brendan, you know, uh, always upset that we're disrespected <laughs> in lane draws and 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 all these other things. So, you know, um, I think across the world now, coaches and also practitioners, certainly in my area, have uh, have started to formulate a lot of their ideas and and are not taking us for granted uh, anymore. And so, maybe just to kind of show what I mean, uh, this is. You know, Canadian consistency in the men's four by one. This is over a 15 year period in the Olympics and world championships. These are completed finals. So that's not, uh, that excludes DQs, DNFs, and doping. You can see Canada right, right there. There's only one country 
um, above us for that. And, uh, you know, potential powerhouses that, that people talk about around the world are, are obviously below us. So, you know, we're, we're right there over a 15 year period. That's pretty impressive stuff that, that these athletes have been able to accomplish. Uh, in terms of the four by four, in terms of a program that what we've uh, instituted, that's been a much shorter period of time. So obviously the women have been around um, competing for a long time, um, but the having a program and support from different services has has been sort of a maybe a seven year project kind of thing. So it's sort of still in its infancy, but you can still see that Canada is really um, up there in top nations and. These are again completed finals. So, out of the last six, we've been in the in four finals. And one thing to note is actually only four countries have actually medaled in in those seven years. So we're right, uh, you know, at the cusp. These women are right at the cusp, and it's only getting stronger and deeper. I want to go back to sort of the beginning of this. Um, Glenn and I spoke, and we we actually we often speak of um, a lot of these things and and how this program sort of developed. And you know, you know, first and foremost, just being a part of this. This this is all about athletes running and doing what they're supposed to do. I collect information, I give that information out, and uh, so it's really about just gathering these types of things. But how we collect that information and how we disseminate it um, is a really important part. And this piece right here, I think, was one of the driving forces is the, you know, the position suitability piece of, of creating a team where you rely on people's strengths. So gathering information, um, it's not just the four fastest runners. And this isn't just for four by one. This goes to four by four. And I'm sure Kyra can, can attest to which position she wants to run and which positions we may think she's the best at. So those are all factors. At the beginning, it all really started with you know, how do we get faster? Keeping it simple was just video. That's, you were talking 15 years ago, almost. This is what, this was cutting edge of just looking at video and being able to sort of um, see what's actually happening. And what that really did was it led to multiple questions. The more, the more you got into it, the more it started creating more information. And so um, these were, this to me is, is probably the one, is one of the biggest piece um, on my side from this program. And uh, and Glenroy can maybe speak on this as well at some point, is this to me is a, is a real, uh, a big piece in, in sort of a marriage of sports science and the art of coaching. And this was a real driving piece of, I had ideas, he had ideas. What are those questions that he's getting and how can I answer them? And how can we sort of ultimately make those athletes perform at their highest? And these are just some of the questions we came up with and, and what that spits out at the end is the way that we sort of analyze. In terms of progression, this is sort of a, a sort of timeline of, of what we did at the very beginning. We had no idea what was going on. We just wanted to look and see what these athletes were doing. Uh, we had nothing about when people were leaving early, all this type of stuff. It was just, let's just watch the video and see what comes of it. Um, and then, you know, that again started to get more questions about, well, what does that mean? And then we created a, a 50 meter zone that just based on the equipment that we had, we couldn't really utilize anything else. So we had this 50 meter arbitrary number. And then it kind of got into more full program of like, what is, what are the incoming, the outgoing runners um, doing and, and how do we visualize that? And, uh, you know, 2012 was, I think was another big, big point of that where there was a full program and, and really utilizing a lot of this data. And then 2016 comes along and these guys are really, really fast. Um, and the women started to join. This was a bit for the women as well. And the four by four started to get that point. And it was new challenges of, you know, we, Glenn, I couldn't bring these guys to Europe for a month and, and drill them. This was, we got to get them when we can because they're fast. They're doing their own thing. Um, same with the women. We got to, how do we create a program where it's such an individualized piece? And so thinking about those different um, ideas and then now moving into this new, this new era of, smaller lighter faster sort of uh data we do a lot of things in competition we kind of scale back some of the things that we did um, and just kind of go with what works so in terms of that we utilize timing systems in the past we've we've utilized everything um, I, I think we started with brower again with that 50 meter time zone uh again arbitrary number but we did it because there's so many pieces right athletes are coming in athletes are leaving there's a baton 
um, Brower timing system just kind of created havoc when there was two people going through it. So, but that's what we did. Uh, then we started used FreeLap to kind of get some of that information. We also, you know, utilized a video with a bunch of sticks that we that we sort of copied off some of the, um, you know, some friends from Germany. And then, you know, now we we realize that a lot of this stuff is cumbersome. We just go back to utilizing video and started to get information off video timing. Um, frame rates and stuff are a lot higher, cameras, everything's more portable. But one of the things that we started to want to look at was um, visualization with the athlete. We had this notion of, you know, passing at the end of the zone was was creating faster times, but sometimes what was it, what looked like a good pass didn't give us the numbers that we thought. And so digging deeper into that of, well, how do we measure what the incoming and outgoing speed of these athletes are and where do they match and where do they um pass the the baton and so we we worked for a long time on creating um you know partnerships with different people and, and getting a device and so we utilized gps and and imu to look at the speed curves of both incoming and outgoing athletes and then also utilizing that in the stride rate in the uh in the women's four by four um and also some of the speed curves to see how they how they play into each other so when we take that information, that's, you know, a lot of that was sort of practice information. When we take it in terms of um, competition, we used to, we started out with the, with the classic IAAF standard middle of the zone is as a hundred meters and everybody gets that time. Um, and then, which is not a true representation of what the actual race is. The four times don't really mean much um, that we found. So then we started looking at individual zone times or sorry, the zone times and then the individual leg times. And that's obviously changed over time with the zones um, getting larger. So we have a sort of the seven split method, the 80 meter of the zone, 70 meter zone, 70 meter zone, and then 90 meters. And so we have historical data over years and years and years of both Canada and um, other countries. And so you can see a little bit of a representation on this. I took out the times, but green is good, yellow is okay, and red is bad. And so you know, you can look at some of those pieces and see where where the good and the bad times are. And then we look at sort of what is the best race that we could get out of the athletes that we have. We also have a method we sort of do with, I, I call it a little bit of quick math. So we can kind of take, um, we utilize it both in four by four and four by one is um, this example here, the women's four by four. You can take seasons best. We've also been looking at an average of three, average of five, and also the nearest um, nearest uh, performance to competition, adding them up and creating a, a performance performance increase. And so the women have kind of done a, a really good job of messing up my spreadsheets because Tokyo 2021, 20, they, uh, they ran unbelievable. And now all my information is, is messed up. So you know, stats are good to sort of create a little bit of insight, but you can't rely on them all the time. So um, in the men's, we also utilize it with uh, sort of a two to three second, um, adding them up, take about two to three seconds, and then depends on if you're a technical versus non-technical team. A lot of the things that we're working on now with continued analytics is looking at uh, passing combinations. So we have, we have data from all practices. Um, looking at say, you know, Aaron into Brendan and, and or Jerome into Brendan or Brendan into Andre or, or either all these crazy combinations. What did it look like? Were they good on the mark? Were they not good on the mark? What were their times? And so we can create a list and see who worked well together. Obviously there's some faults in that, but it kind of gives us a little bit of a picture as well. Um, this one is also uh, a big piece that sort of, validates what we've always kind of talked about is pushing to the end of the zone and so you can see kind of the zones there one two three on top of each other each one of those dots represents a pass that is all the passes that i've collected from world championships and olympic games not just from canada but from all the other countries as well so green is good red is not so good you can see more green to the end of the end of the zone um, and then we can start picking part we can filter through and analyze as much as we want and then the last little bit that we're working on now with the women's four by four is, is is creating a bit of an issue because of the you know with with COVID we've we've stopped utilizing a lot of things and and putting things on athletes in competition is a little bit tougher just because they're not accustomed to it. But ultimately, we'd like to get back to it 
sort of getting more information in competition so we can create sort of individual race reports that can go out to coaches and and sort of give uh, more information back to the coaches so that they're more prepared when they come to the relay program. And I think I summed it up in, I don't think it was a little more than five minutes maybe, but um, that's about as good as I could do. So I didn't want to make anybody <laughs> make anybody jealous. So I put both Brendan and Kyra and that was it. These are the most important ones here anyway. Yeah, of course. That's awesome. Thanks. So um, I think like we, there are a couple of questions that jumped to my mind just coming out of that. Um, first question is, I, so I noticed this in one of the early stat pages. Why Poland? What? So I know like after the world championships and after the Olympics, I'd look at, you know, how the meet is scored, like as a at points, like, you know, like top one to eight and, you know, it's Jamaica, Kenya, USA, and then it's Poland and then it's us. So why, why is Poland there? Do you have any insight into that? I'll really want to uh, the Polish relay team, but I just, it's just a curiosity. To me. Yeah. Yeah. Like as an overall or just with the relay? Well, well the relay. Just, and, yeah. 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 I, I mean, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not sure as to why, again, sometimes it's, um, you know, like I said, I collect the information and then we look at it. And then if it sparks more engagement, then we do. I can't, I mean, I, it'd be hard pressed for me to say why they're actually there, yeah. but I can tell you that they are there. Okay. <laughs> I, I you just, can see maybe, that they're there. Yeah. I thought maybe there was some, you know, like a known thing that was going on with that. So yeah. we have a really um, uh, specific uh, question for you here, uh, just out of that. Steve LeBlanc is asking, what what sample rate of GPS units were are you using? Any spatial ac and spatial accuracy too? Are these the off the shelf models or specialty devices? Yeah. So of course, Steve would ask this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're five they're five uh they're five hertz with gps with imus in them so uh, the imu kind of offsets some of it however um to me the bigger piece is the, and these were custom made years ago so i mean there's way way better pieces out now however um you know when i sort of look at things it's what we needed at the time and also reliability versus accuracy and so creating a system where we can utilize it over and over again um we know there's faults in it but uh the main piece was at the originally started as a visualization tool so to see to allow the athletes and and again maybe these two can speak more on it to see if it actually helped them but creating a you know a visualization of this athlete's doing this speed and this athlete's doing this speed rather than having a spreadsheet so you know the technicality of it of of the validation of what they were actually getting not as important in in that setting but there are certainly better ones yeah okay that, that's that's really fascinating so um let's let's shift from this sort of like you were just saying the sort of like statistical kind of you know view to the 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 the, the human side of the team so i want to start with glenroy because glenroy is the the kind of you know the leader of this the captain of the ship and and obviously you know, a member of the most sort of famous and decorated of Canada's relay teams. Um, Glenn Roy, how, how did that team, being on that team and winning that gold medal, influence you in terms of the way you've led the relay programs since you've been been in charge here? Um, okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. I think um I think when I when I look back at at the way we were as a as a team back in the in the mid to late 90s I think it was we came together when we needed to come together um, not probably the best strategy however it was just the strategy of the day for us so I think when when I look at the athletes today they do the, they relatively do the same things the only difference obviously is that we have a formal program we have something that the athletes have committed to they've bought into and certainly have been supporting so I think back back in the mid in the mid '90s, when we were doing it, it was it was a bit um, it was a bit inconsistent, and we and we saw that with uh, with the way things went for a while. But then we started to hit hit our stride in a sense, and um, and you started to see, of course, the performances. And, and it was primarily um, like four by one. So I think um, when you when you look at it now, it's all the relays. It's four by ones. It's four by fours. It's mixed relays. We're doing. We're trying to do it all and make sure that we. Um, we put our best forward so our athletes can perform at their very best when it counts. Awesome. Thanks for that. That's a great, great answer. So and to so to Brendan and, and Cara to go back a bit to what Dana was saying, how how does that 
that stuff that that he brings how does how do you kind of interact with that how does that affect your you know your kind of thinking or, or, or preparation Kyra why don't we start with you um with Dana we've used more of like the, the charts I don't think I have I've had anything strapped to me yet for competition but we've done the charts and it's cool to like see the visuals and see like this person's run that time this person run that time their season time and it kind of helps collectively place where we think well coach doesn't always place with us but like <laughs> it's cool to like see it and maybe sometimes have an input and like work together and build a team well brandon what how how do you uh interact with this the, the numbers uh well <laughs> i'm gonna be as political as dana um <laughs> For us, like, you know, just seeing the different waves and, and understanding that, you know, if you're at the top as the incoming runner, the outgoing runner needs to match your speed. And that's basically what he was saying, like more of a visual aid, seeing that, okay, I was matching the speed on this one and then on the other one, I wasn't. So that's why the pass wasn't as good or that's why the pass was better because of this and that. So um, for us, it was really just, you know, hitting it home, driving, driving the nail home to know that, all right, when we do something good, everything lines up as, as it should. And when we don't do something good, we can see it not only on the charts, not only in the video, but like even in real life, we see where we make the mistakes. Makes sense. So, okay, maybe this is a real sort of distance runner asking this question, it might be obvious, but you're talking about matching speeds. Is it always incumbent on the on the outgoing runner to, to sort of match the speed? Or is there a situation where the incoming runner is like, okay, I got to take my foot off the gas a bit so that this pass can be better? Would that ever happen? Or is it always the outgoing runner who's like, okay, it's, it's on me? Well, it's really always on the outgoing runner. But, you know, of course, as the ingoing, incoming runner, you kind of try to make adjustments in order to ensure that the pass comes off you know, safely, as well as, you know, you don't hurt yourself or hurt the other person. Makes sense. Um, okay, so, and, uh, you know, I think um, it's been alluded to a bit about how, you know, the people are fast and they've got, you know, individual events too. So when you're, when you're coming into a major games and, you know, that's sort of like the, the, the pressure is on, there's, there's the, you know, the focus on the relay teams, you know, and I think, you know, probably everybody's, always expecting a medal now. So how, how do you balance your preparation in, in, in that, like for your own events that obviously you want to do well um, and, and the team event? I mean, if you look at, you know, the greatest athletes of all, all time, they, they do well in relays as well. And you understand that, you know, it's equally as important as just your individual events. So for us, it's just like, our, we have regular practice and then we just schedule a day for really practice and we go out there and do what we got to do handle business if it's five passes we do five if it's one we do one and we ensure that we go out there and do it to the best of our abilities because on race they only get one opportunity yeah similar to brendan i kind of just take it day by day so i look at the whole schedule look at the whole meet and i know this day is open for this day is, and I have to know what to do to advance in that. And then you move on to the next day and the next day, maybe you get a break in between, you recover, you get ready. And then you have the next day and you do that until the end. And every day you have to show up and be your best. But at least I mentally know that I have something like, I know the days that I have something and I'm ready on those days. Yeah, makes sense. So the preparation for for these meets, how often are you meeting up for, for camps and, and that? Like, I mean, I think, I, you know, I think we, if you look on the, on the schedule, you can kind of see sometimes the big camps, but like, is there, you know, what's the, the expectation, maybe Glenroy, like, what's your expectation of how often you think people need to get together? How much are they actually getting together? Yeah, I think, I, I really think it varies. It varies with the four by one uh, men and women. It, it varies with the four by four uh, program, just because you know, one is a, a blind pass four by ones and visual, of course, four by four. So, and, and a lot of times, um, especially at least historically, our four by four, our four by four women and men usually are in decent form right around April, um, April, May. So we try to get them together to run a relay then. And, and in most cases, something later on, if it's possible. But it's it's less important to get the four by fours together as it is for the four by ones, just because there's a lot of technical work 
to be done um, with your four by one program. Um, and, and again, you're, you're dealing with a lot of athletes, you're dealing with a lot of variables that you need to consider when you're putting different teams and you've got to get them to run. I mean, what we've learned over the years is that it's great to have, you know, these fast guys and, and young ladies, but if we don't expose them to competition and to high level competition, and that would mean, yeah, we may start off at some of the US colleges and, and run camps down there, but then uh, the, the hope is to get to Europe at least right before a major championship so that we are lining up against some of the best teams in the world. And then it gives us a, a chance and an opportunity to kind of see where we are. Um, there's nothing like competition at the highest level for uh, athletes to figure it out. And if they can do it at a Diamond League, they can certainly do it at a World Championship and an Olympic Games. So, again, this is a lot of, a lot of variables, a lot of different um, things that go into the planning and the execution of the relay program. But again, all of it is, is centered around giving the athletes the best opportunities to perform uh, when it counts the most, and that's at the World Championships and the Olympic Games. Right on. So, okay, so we're going to get a question from the audience that I think we should ask now, because speaking of performance on demand, um, the question is from Jared, Jared Connaughton, former relay, relay guy. He wants to know Glenroy or anyone, but mostly Glenroy, how come the Americans can't figure this out? Uh, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and I'll let the athletes. Uh, I think it's not a matter of, um, I think it's not a matter of figuring it out for them. I think you're, you're dealing with a lot of very, very, very talented uh, individuals. This is just my um, my opinion. I think you're dealing with certainly a huge talent pool. You're dealing with shoe companies. You're dealing with different coaches. You're dealing with uh, different relay relay coaches from time to time to try to get these. So you're you're really working not simply just with the athletes in that in that coaching environment and trying to bring them to camps and these type of things. It's hugely challenging when you're when you've got athletes, uh, such high caliber athletes with all different uh, objectives and plans for the major championship. So uh, I don't envy um, the relay coach for the US and uh, and, and um, Michael Marsh is I think the new the, the new guy in post because it is a challenge. Um, and I think that it, it's just because you're dealing with a lot of different personalities and a lot of moving parts around those athletes that makes it very difficult to get them all together to work uh, relays. Makes sense. Do the athletes want to chime in on that or not really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to touch that. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get, we're going to get emails after this. That's okay. Once in a while, we're going to have a Canada, Canada brags uh, podcast or webinar or whatever. It's okay. <laughs> you know? Um, so, but so to kind of jump off on that a bit, like, you know, uh, Glenn, I mentioned just all the different moving parts uh, in the competition on the day of the competition, what, what are the conversations like, you know, with, with the athletes and, and the coach, like, so Cara mentioned each day, you know, you've got your individual events. So, okay. So it's re it's relay day. Say it's like, it's, it's rounds. And what, what, what are the, what are the conversations like? How, what, what are the types of things that, that you're discussing, you know, coach and athlete on that day? I think it's a really supportive environment. I think everybody's like, we go around as a group, making sure everybody's okay. The coach want to know you're okay. You're in the right mindset. You're ready to do what we have to do, whether the job is prelims, you have to advance to semis or finals, or if it's finals, we're going for the medal. I think it's a very supportive environment. The coaches like to do like a little cheer with us before we go in the call room. I'm not that loud, so I'm not the best person <laughs> to cheer, <laughs> but like, it's fun. And it's something that you know, it makes relays fun because track is a really individual sport. And when you get to be on a relay, instead of being out there by yourself, you're out there with your team. And I think that's what makes it really cool. Nice. Brendan, what do you uh, think? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, it's, you know, two different kind of worlds when you compare the 4 by one and the 4 by 4 So where they're doing, you know, blind exchanges, I mean, they're doing visual exchanges, we're doing blind. So, you know, our goal is to, you know, get the stick around safely, especially in the rounds. Um, so, you know, we're just focused on ourselves. We're not trying to do anything out of the norm. You know, our, our pre-race speech is always the same. I mean, I'm not gonna tell you guys, but, you know, it's basically just doing the, 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 the basics, um, fundamental stuff of, you know, relay running. And then, you know, everything else will kind of, fall into place after. Well, Dana and, and Glenroy, how, how is it for you on, on race day? 
Well, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. For me, it's really, it's a lot of nerves. I mean, an unbelievable um, time because, you know, you have absolutely no control. I mean, in some ways, we think we have control, but we really have none. It's uh, it's 100% the athletes in control. They are kind of, we're just there to navigate and steer them and make sure it's almost like herding cats in some ways, just to keep them together in, in one area to make sure that they get through their warmups. But it's there, they're there in some cases um, with, with either a staff coach or their personal coach that will come out to support the, uh, the relay and the relay program as a whole. And we just get through the warm up and make sure that the athletes are 100% in the right frame of mind. They understand what's expected. And, and again, the cell now is much easier than it was before. And the athletes really understand. They want, they want to win medals. They want to get on the podium. So it's really not a lot of conversations. Um, one of the things that I think Brendan has said to me time and time again, and, it, and, and, and is, that, is that trust, like to trust them, trust that we'll, we'll get the job done. And uh, that wasn't always an easy thing. I, I know um, with our, like when I'm working, of course, with the women's four by four, it's like, the conversation with them is it's similar. But again, you know that the women's four by four has always had a way on paper, they look this way, but they when they get on the track, they perform at a, at a way higher level. So you just never know what's going to happen. You just have to, again, trust the athletes to go out there and put their best foot forward. And, and they typically always do, at least uh, lately. Yeah, you know, what about you? Probably it, even worse. It, you probably feel even more removed from it, having any control. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, race day. I don't, I don't really talk to anybody. That's <laughs> my conversation. My conversations, if I'm talking about things on race day, that means something has probably gone pretty wrong. And so, you know, we, we've had those conversations in between rounds, but um, you, you know, a lot of the conversations that I have are, are with Glenroy um, leading up to those days. And, and most of it is kind of around, you know, what, what are, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Going back and forth. Here's the information that I have. Um, you know, and we've had some friendly ones and we've had some heated ones. And so I think this is, you know, but it, it, everything comes together and it's the same message and, and the same voice. And like Brendan said, it's it's nothing new. It's nothing, um, you know, out of the blue on, on that day. But uh, it's, yeah, the conversations I have are, are generally well before. Yeah. So maybe maybe one of these before conversations would be about the order. So what what are some of the factors that go into the order picking the order and and for for brendan and, and Kara, what what positions do, you know what where would you like to be you know in in the order and 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 where are you usually <laughs> I mean, we start with the coaches and and, and their take on you know how, how they come up with these things um i think the order really for the last little while has except with maybe the women's four by four i think sometimes we can move them a bit but Uniquely on the women's side, um, I think a lot of times we we have we have exceptional uh, 400 meter four by four women that can run well uh, in various positions. So a lot of times, I, I'll tell you where was it? I think in Tokyo. I I and this is really an interesting um, story. In in that I had an idea as to what I wanted to see and who I wanted to run where, and uh, I gave the women's four by four team the, the order. And um, and then they 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 were like okay uh, we we agreed this is what they were going to do they went out and ran and then and then they came back and for the final uh, Kyra and Sage pretty much and and this is and this is the kind of thing we encourage we encourage like open dialogue as long as the athletes were athletes and coaches were respectful we uh, we speak to each other a certain way but certainly open to hear the the feedback of the athletes because ultimately. If they think that running it a certain order is going to produce a, a faster time and it's going to make the athletes more comfortable in those positions that they're in, I am all for it because ultimately that's what it's about, right? It's not you, it's not me just arbitrarily saying, okay, you're going to run here and you don't have a you don't have a say in it, right? So um, the women wanted to flip the order, I think for uh, for Tokyo, and they went out there and ran, you know, three three twenty one eight something that we none of us saw that coming and maybe Dana can speak a little bit on that because it was absolutely exceptional yeah that uh yeah in terms of order I think that goes back to that position suitability you know talk that we you know I my, I make informed choices on 
on data and things that have happened. And I try and keep bias out. Obviously, it's, you know, being around a program for so long, I, I do have some bias, but I try and keep sort of objective measures and give my opinion based on numbers. And, and then that's where that combination of, of the art and of coaching and the science piece comes in of these pieces go where and then, you know, that type of, well, you know, Kyra likes to chase people down. This is a, this is something that she likes to do. Is this, how do we, how do we utilize that? Or, or, you know, in the scenarios where she was maybe the fastest runner, do we put her on the end? Well, those are type of information that we met had or conversations that we've had. But again, it ultimately comes down to with the four by four, like Glenn Roy said, having that athlete in, input and voice is a, is a big piece of that. Um, sort of on the men's side, you, you know, with the four by one, like Glenroy said, it, it's been a it, sort of not static, but it, I mean, there's always, I think he's kind of giving it a simplistic <laughs> part here. The, there, there's an order that has been run for quite a while, but there's also orders behind the scenes that sort of have been, um, you know, talked about and worked and, and discussed. And, and that's where those discussions have. So, you know, there's, there's been many a times when something happens and it has to be switched up and those may seem random, but <clears throat> but there is a method to the madness. And so it's not always, uh, you know, when they are just this one position, you, you picture sort of Aaron and Jerome and Brendan and Andre that, that is, but Aaron wasn't always there. And so, but that piece was, was not just thrown in. There was, there was conversations about, will this work? How does that work? And so there's always contingencies laid in place. I think, I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so Kara, what, so it was mentioned, you like to chase people down. What's your preferred leg? I like to run third. Third. Okay. Why I like is that? To run it in the middle and like in the thick of whatever is happening and it's kind of mumble jumble and you get to just move around. I think, I don't know, I have the most fun doing third, but anchor's not too bad. <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a second favorite. Okay. Brendan, what about you? You know, honestly, that. Uh, now at my age and where we are in the program it doesn't really matter as long as i'm out there on the finals day then that's the most important thing for me and i think that's how all the guys are going to look at it now um, as long as we you know are out there and we we're able to perform you know we're going to give it our best and, and that's how we are successful yeah so and is it i mean i think it, in, in my head, it's like, okay, so leg two on the four by one is sort of like a longer leg, like you would potentially try to to get more, or maybe it's not true. I don't know. Is, is there, what, what are the different kind of ideas about like who would go first? Like maybe obviously a good starter would go first, but is it, can you, can you share some of those, um, those kind of ideas that go into why you would put someone in a certain position? I mean, I think, it, it comes down to just like their style of running and you know what people excel at and what people aren't good at. Um, if you are able, like if you sit down and watch track and field, you'll watch Aaron run a turn and you know he's always one of the first guys off the corner. Um, you also watch Jerome and he may not start well, but you know once he gets going, it's like a it's a steam train, you know, so or a rolling pin coming down a hill. So you know you have him there, and then Andre, he's you know, one of the best finishers in the world. And, you know, you put him there, you're going to get success. Um, so it's just basically seeing people's tendencies. I mean, if you watch any other team sport, you, you it's the same thing. You know, you do a scouting report, it's people's tendencies. And, you know, this is what they're good at. This is what they're not good at. So this is what you, you want them not to do. This is what you want them to do. Is there any consideration for the other teams because you talk bring up like team sports scouting reports like okay so would, would there be any consideration of like okay we want you know uh you know brendan going up against this this polish guy or whatever uh, uh, I, we're shaking his head because was like no i think more that that's more of a four by four thing where it's, it's it's more of a tactical race than than you know a four by one where you really can't control what anybody else does i mean everybody has their own lane as long as you do what you're supposed to do, then, you know, you'll be the best that you can be. So it, may, it doesn't mean you're going to win, but it just means that you're going to do your best. Whereas a four by four, like, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not the four by four specialist here, but I mean, there's bumping and, you know, everybody ends up in lane one. So it's a lot more tactics than, than what we have in the world. 
Don, why do you want to get your mic on there? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. I mean, in, with regards to the men's four by one, we just, again, we run athletes based on where we think we can get the most out of them and where it seems like it fits. Uh, p- position suitability is massive uh, for these guys. And similar to what uh, Brendan just talked about, it's like a, a person like Aaron Brown has run three different positions. In fact, he's, yeah, he's run three different legs on this relay team. He's, he's, he's leading off now. He was run the backstretch and he's anchored the team before. So again, athletes that can run in different positions and we can see that and figure out the strength of those athletes in that position and how it how it fits with the entire um, relay as a whole makes a huge difference. And Jerome just fits in the back because again, he's a left-handed passer. He's a big body. He can, he's a moving train, similar to what Brendan just said. And it makes for a very easy pass for a left-handed guy going on, on the outside of the track. So it, it all kind of fits with the guys that are there now. Um, you know, with with the women's with the women's um, four by four, we have to look at a good starter, somebody who can really um, get out. But then the, the second person that we put in has got to be someone that can get in the mix and also knows how to cut cut in after the uh, the break and how how are they going to navigate that? And then uh, the third person is really going to have to fight to put the team in a position to where the anchor person doesn't uh, doesn't well they're still going to have to work real hard. But the last two legs are really critical in the outcome of the relay. Great. Thanks. This is super, super insightful and, and interesting. Um, what about, uh, you know, sort of outside of position stuff, just team cohesion and, and that, like, and we talked about, you know, spending time together and, and how that's sort of bit at a premium. So how, how do you form that, that team cohesion, you know, when you're not you know, kind of always together in the dressing room sort of thing, like with a, with a team sport? Um, oh sorry I didn't know for us um we have the camps which some not everybody can come to the camp sometimes the camps are a good opportunity to kind of be around um our teammates outside of a meet so it's a different environment you can like go to lunch without the stress of meat so I think camps are a good way of team bonding um when we get to the meets and we compete together I think that's also just a way in itself of kind of bonding us together and you know that it gives us a team group motivation of like how we're going to do next year and stuff like that and how we have to work together. So those are my answers. Right. Uh, <laughs> I think for the men's four by one is a lot different. Um, one of the biggest factors is that we've been around each other for years. Um, we've been running against each other from high school or playing other sports like me and Aaron played basketball each other played against each other like the age of 14. You know, so wow. for us our our kind of cohesiveness is is, is kind of just built through friendship. Um, mm-hmm. when we're at meets it's 24-7, the four of us or the five of us or the six of us. So you put 10 years and then two weeks each year. 24 seven, you know, you kind of just kind of build a cohesion that you can't really build with two weeks of just, or a week of just passing. So I think that's a big factor for us um, that we have over everybody in the world. That's cool to hear just that it goes back so far. So how does, how does someone break into the, the relay program then? Like what happens if, you know, there's a new kid on the block, just like sub 10, you know, blasting it. And, and how, how does that person get integrated into the team? Cause you know, it's, it's working, but, but then you have this, you know, there's new elements, younger people coming up. So coaches, how, how are you, how are you gonna, you know, manage that sort of situation? I mean, a lot of times we, this is, this is why we have the creation of the relay pools. We invite athletes that are top ranked in the country to these relay camps in Florida, Baton Rouge, um, and we we pretty much start drilling like relay skills and figure out where that athlete could possibly fit um, and what that would make the team look like. Obviously, there's always an opportunity for an athlete that comes in with good skill, good speed, the ability to um, to get along and work well with others and um, and understand that there is once the individual event is over, there is a there is a 100 percent focus on the relay and delivering 
high performance on on any of our relay teams. So it really is quite, I think, pretty straightforward. We have we have a relay agreement that athletes signed, and then all of it just kind of outlines the expectations from the uh, from the athletes to be a part of the program. So, but Glenroy, what what is it going to take for you to take Rodney out and put a new kid in? Because he's getting old. He's mentioned he's getting old. So what, you know, what's, well, what's. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the person would have to be, obviously, if, if, if Brendan or any of the athletes as part of that four by four by one team or, or, or the women's four by four speed, you know, the ability, the ability to do the job when it counts the most um, with a, with the men's relay, you've got to be able to handle the heat at a world championships or the Olympics. And how do you get that? Well, you get those again from the diamond league meets, you get experience, you show that you're, you're ready to step in to anybody's, uh, spot. If someone, if someone doesn't do their job and they leave that door open for you, though, well, that's obviously on them, but certainly if, if the athlete is talented enough and we've recognized that they can contribute to the program continuing to produce performance results on the men or the women's team, they'll be there. They'll be running. All right. Okay. I got more fun questions now. That was, that was a top, tough question. I know. Um, so <laughs> on your team, and this is well, the hundred and the 400 who on your team would win a 600. Brandon, Bre- you put your hand up for yourself or you have an, just an answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I would say me. (laughs) Okay. Good. All right. We picked the right candidates. That's good. That's good. Uh, How come? Why? Why did you say that, Kyra? Why is it you? Because I have to always bet on myself. Yeah. Hope for the best. (laughs) Brandon. I mean, we were talking before. Brandon was saying, you know, about how, you know, basically now all the best hundred meter guys have to be able to do do a a good four, but a six. Why? Why do you think you can run a good six? Um, oh okay i have the best uh, four inch pv okay um but i just think like like, you know 600 is kind of a a gritty event so you just got to be somebody who has that kind of grit to go for it so i don't know i think that's me as well yeah that's good and both of you are just like because i want it more basically i love it that's great (laughs) that's what you need so okay another another hypothetical given let's say we got you know the technology the tracks the new shoes and everything like that who's going to win the 96 team or the 2022 for men's four by one team dana dana Dana, you gotta you could probably tell us with the stats right the question is who's going to win a race between the 96 men's four by one team and the 2022 men's four by one team i i I'm going to get grilled for this. I know, but I, I, the, I think these new guys are just too much. <laughs> I think we've seen too many things. I would have said the same thing. No issues. I mean, yeah, I, I think even though you have the top two hundred meter guys on, on the 96 team, like in Canadian history, we have the top four 200 meter guys, like hands down, there's no one close to us going to engines so it does bode that we have speed and even though we have the top four 200 meter guys these guys are still three four and five in the 100 meter um mm-hmm. so you know you 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 lose out either way i take i take that back i think we would handle this guy. <laughs> there you go there you go <laughs> next next really can we guess set something up i don't know i mean i'll talk to bruni's in my my town i'll talk to bruni see if he wants to come back um so Okay, so we have some some audience questions now. So this might not, you know, sort of be a bit, bit back and forth here. Um, I mean, I, I guess actually this you answered this question already. The 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 question is is 200 fitness relevant to to the 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 two, three, four legs that have a running start? It sounds like 200 fitness is is relevant for for all of it. And and I would say maybe just to, to add Kyra into it on the on the 400, like the, having that, you know, kind of like for the 400, it's like shorter speed to have the, the 200. Um, you know, how, how much are you working on, on that as well and on your end? Maybe Kara can start. Um, I think the 200 is super important to run a good 400. I'm still working on it, but I think it's important because you need the first half. You want to be able to run the first half of a 400 as easy as possible, but fast. And you need to have a good 200 to do that. And then the second half is where the endurance part. So I guess the 600 would come in. Mm-hmm. So I think they're both important. You need both 
speed and endurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a question from uh, Eric, uh, catch Eric's last name. Um, how often would you train relays? Like, so we're talking at a club level or like a non-elite level. So we're thinking about, you know, like a high school team or, or even a university team. Um, and, and maybe, you know, from your experience of coming up to the sport, like how, how often were, were relays a part of it? Would you have, you know, every practice that, you know, do some relay stuff or a separate set relay practice? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that for, for, you know, high school or university club coaches? Is that a, well, I, I, could jump in. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think relay, relay skill development at the youngest age. I mean, if you're running indoors, uh, just basic knowledge of how to run uh, a relay, a four by one, a four by four, a four by two. If you're in Canada and indoors, there's a lot of that. I think, I think that if you can, once athletes start, I think you can start that at the very basic level and, and flats and then to spikes and, but you don't have to make it a, uh, it can be something that's in your program uh, weekly where you're doing one session, you can, you can turn it into excels with the, with the baton or excels with some passes. Um, and that's a Monday workout. You do it once a week. I think the more you can upskill the athletes, the better the better prepared they're going to be when they're at that higher level. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel. A lot of athletes come even to the national program, and you've got to you've you've got to go through the relay fundamentals with them simply because they don't know they don't know how to pass a stick. Okay, so I think that this is stuff that you can start it at the club level and work your work with the kids all the way up, and that way they're better prepared when they get to the the senior level. Cool. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's the most fun part, right? I mean, really are, are fun. So I think at that, at that level, like, you know, keeping people engaged and, and, and stuff is, is awesome. Another question at the, about, um, all from Eric, I, I, it's the same Eric, Eric Klein. Um, I just want to check. Yes. The same Eric, Eric Klein. Sorry, Eric, for not getting your last name there. Um, how, how do you convince, uh, youth level sort of short sprinters to run the four by four? they think or they think they're they're short sprinters how, how do you convince them that they should do a four by four dan are you laughing do you have a, an answer to that You're mute. Hold on. no i don't have an answer i just have i just have experience watching people get asked to run four by four when they <laughs> don't want to that's all not i'm not prepared to answer yeah um, i would say you just put it listen it's it's like anything i think it's more of a canadian uh, a Canadian mentality that we don't we don't have kids run the longer stuff 400s. That's why in the U.S. the the the, the relay for them is the four by four. It's not the four by one. The priority relay for the the Americans is four by four. So I think it's just a mentality and the fact that we don't we don't expose our athletes. Everyone in Canada believes that they're a 100 200 meter sprinter, and I think that that's kind of a faulty. Uh, faulty way to think about it. I think expose them to all the events and get them out there running fours, four by fours. I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Not for myself, obviously, because I was, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, absolutely. For the young kids, they should be doing it. I coached at a middle school program last year and at practice, I would make sure that all the, sh even if they were a short spinner, that they would run a 400 at practice so they know what it feels like. So when it comes time to the meet and they don't want to do it or they, say they can't do it, I tell them like, you kind of already did. Like, you know, you can, you made it. So then that's how I did it. Yeah, well, and also like, what are you, you're not going to say no to Coach Kara, come on. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, it's funny because it goes the other way too. Like, you know, the, the distance runners uh, being asked, you know, university team to drop down and run a four by four. Not always, not always jumping, jumping in to do that, but yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Brendan, did you have a comment on that? I mean, I think you got to run it if you want to be at the, the highest level. I mean, you yeah. have Usain Bolt who runs four by fours, fastest yeah. guy ever. Like, Yo, Johan Blake ran four by fours, fast, second fastest guy ever. Tyson yeah. Gay, 44. Tyson Gavin probably did it in college. So like you go down the line and you look at the best sprinters ever, all of them have run four by fours or run open fours. So hmm. you got to look at what your goal is, you know, and even if you feel like you want to be a hundred meter sprinter, you got to get, you got to get some toughness in, in order to do a four by four. And I, I mean, you go, you come on even our four by one, all four of us, I think we probably could break the Canadian record in the four by four. Yeah. 
All right. So when's that happening? When when are we going to see that team run a four by four? Conroy, line up. Yeah. Um. So so the the answer was at Canadian Championships. Is that right? That's I didn't hear what. No, you were the answer about. is there's another group that got to qualify us, and then we'll run at the majors. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have a question for Kyra. Do you want to run a four by eight? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, what do we got here? Okay. Ke Kenneth Poskett, who is an organizer at the Harry Jerome track meet. Um, so for meet, I guess, meet directors, how can we contribute to the relay program? Um, should, should meets be adding really like these sort of, you know, our Can Canadian national series be adding relays to the program. Do you think that'd be a good thing to do? It's a Glenroy question, but I guess anyone can answer, but specifically ask Glenroy. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, anytime there, there's opportunities to run relays, I think it's a good thing. Um, so that can certainly help us. Now, the, the key obviously is, is timing around where, when can we get our best athletes at these at these events and if it's and if it's worthwhile right versus getting them to a diamond league in europe where there's gonna there where there's gonna be more international teams the, the level of competition is gonna be quite high um so we weigh all those things when making decisions around when to where and when to run relays so i think if our canadian meets can offer that level of competition and i think it's obviously a viable option for us cool um okay we're, we're Two two minutes away from the hour. Um, I've got a pretty pretty technical question here, so I think people might be interested to hear the answer to this. It's from Ronald Hewer. Um, so there's basically three three types of exchanges, right? You have upwards, downwards, and push. Um, Glenn Roy, do you consider various exchanges based on the athlete statistics and style, or do you stick to one system in general? Have you ever changed the sort of the, the system of exchange? mid-season or one year to another like how do you choose which the way that you're going to pass we've always done the canadian style of relay running is a push pass so we've always used the push pass um we try to maximize the distance between the two athletes so we can make sure that the outgoing runner is hit in full stride with full extension of the arm so we've always used the push pass we haven't never um, used a sweep or an overhanded pass Hey. I'm, I'm going to chime in because I think there's a funny part to this. It, it, when I first started working with with relays and uh, Glenroy, I asked him the same question of why why this and and not anything else. And considering the success of underhand sweep in in other things, and so trying to to engage in some of these things, and then you realize that um, it's it sometimes it just doesn't work, you know. And uh, you know, there's there's benefits to each one of them, but like Glenroy said, it, this is that piece of like, this is what's been ingrained in Canada, but it's also um, grounded in foundation of, of creating that free space that he talked about. You know, the underhand pass is, is a fast pass, but it creates a climbing stick. So you start to lose that. The Japanese tried to um, change a way to, to get rid of that. And, you know, we, we were in Japan and, and some of the junior teams have now switched to an, to an overhand or a push pass. So, you know, I think there's, there's, cost benefits on all these and the push pass is by far you know so it's not just ingrained in Canada there is sound um evidence to why it's being done okay all right um I think I think we're gonna end it there with uh with right on the hour so um thank thanks everyone for for that that's uh, I think probably one of the one of the most sort of high high level uh webinars we've had and lots of really interesting things great insight into what uh, what makes Canadians great in, in this area. Um, so really, really proud to, and, and uh, happy to have hosted this. Um, so thanks everyone. Have a, have a great uh, holiday season. Um, we will uh, be, uh, you can check your uh, coaching newsletter and the Athletics Canada newsletter for what our, our next sort of series of webinars are going to be. Um, and, uh, and for the recording of this one, you can check it out on our uh, Athletics Canada YouTube page as well. Uh, so thanks everyone and uh, yeah, have a good night.